Today we're going to be understanding how search engines rank the billions of web pages that exist on the web, and in particular, gain some insight into the idea of page rank, which was pioneered by Google and which drives most of the world's search engines today. So let's start with a simple question. How do you find what you're looking for on the web? It's a question we answer through what we do every day, multiple times a day. If this was a question I was asking you back in 1994, then your answer probably would have been, I go to Yahoo. At that point, Yahoo was a directory of the web. The web was small enough that people who worked for Yahoo would index each web page by hand, would go out and find all the content that was on the web, would read the pages, figure out what the page was about, and then assign it a category in their directory. So how did the people who worked for Yahoo find all the pages on the web? Well, they would go to one web page, they would then click on the hyperlinks on that page, and they would use those to discover other pages. So by this process of surfing the web, Yahoo would index all the different pages on the web. Now this process highlights something that fundamentally distinguishes information on the web from information you might get from a book or from a magazine or from a newspaper. Information in a book is organized in a linear way. You turn page after page, and if you want to jump to a different part of the book, you have to go to the index, you have to look up a concept, and if you're lucky enough to have that concept indexed, then you can find the page number associated with the new idea. Uh, the web is organized in a fundamentally different way. It is organized as hypertext. So let's take a look at what hypertext is. The pioneering idea of the web, what made it really powerful when it first came out over 25 years ago, was this notion of organizing information as hypertext where you could highlight certain portions of a document and have them link directly to an entirely new page. So it converted the organization of information from being linear, the way it is in a book, to being like a network, where you could jump from one idea to the other without being constrained by a linear flow. So the web is not the only collection of hypertext, but it is by far the largest collection of hypertext that exists and that is likely to exist. The design of hypertext reflects how our brain wants to consume information. You might be reading a particular page and you might see a concept that you want to learn more about. Hypertext allows you to explore the content in a way that is more natural for your brain. Of course, it's not 1994 anymore. The web is no longer a collection of tens of thousands of pages. There are literally billions and billions of pages on the web. And so when thinking about how to find the information that you're looking for on the web today, there are two issues that come up. The first is often you don't know the exact page that you're looking for. You might be looking for things related to an idea, but you don't know the exact identity of the pages that you're looking for. And the second challenge is that even if you did know the identity of those pages, the web might be too vast today to start from a familiar page and click through links and reach where you want to be. So let's return to the question that we started with. How do you find what you're looking for on the web today? So what I'd like you to do is to pause the video and take a few moments to think about the different ways in which you find information that you're looking for using the web today. All right, so chances are that you answered this question in one of two ways. You either thought about a favorite website that you start with, say the New York Times or Wikipedia, or more likely, you thought about the search engine that you use. And depending on where you live, it was probably one of these search engines. So the way that we find information on the web has changed fundamentally from the early days of the web. We search for the information that we're looking for rather than navigating the web and surfing through these different pages that are linked to each other. Now, in the early days of the web, none of these search engines existed. So if you remember using the web in the mid-1990s and searching for information, chances are that you used AltaVista or Lycos 
or InfoSeek. I remember AltaVista was my favorite search engine. Now these search engines used a fundamentally different technology from what modern search engines use today. They would use computer programs to browse the web and find all the web pages. If a web page mentioned a concept repeatedly, then loosely speaking, the search engines would assume that this was a more important source of content about that concept. So for example, a page that mentioned Britney Spears back in the mid 1990s repeatedly might be considered a more important source of information about Britney Spears than a page that mentioned her casually just once. Of course, this approach to ranking web pages led to a problem almost immediately. Spammers who wanted to attract you to their web page would think about the most popular search terms, Britney Spears or Bill Clinton, and then would include thousands of mentions of these terms at the bottom of their pages, often in white text that you couldn't see, to try and confuse the search engines into promoting their content to the top of the search results. As a consequence, until 1996 or 1997, search engines were useful, but they were frustrating. You'd often get thousands of results that were completely irrelevant to what you were looking for, and you had to comb through the results of a search engine to actually find something of relevance. And then along came Google, and many of us who used Google in the mid to late 1990s remember the magic associated with incredibly good search results almost immediately. As Google started to gain popularity in 1997 and 1998, users were amazed at how much better a job Google seemed to do at figuring out what was important and what should be the top search result when you typed in a particular search query. The secret sauce behind Google's search approach 20 years ago and today was an idea called PageRank. So let's try and understand what was so special about the PageRank approach. Older search engines used a content-based approach. They treated each web page as an isolated entity. They analyzed the content of that page. They perhaps analyzed the source of that page, and they made a determination about how important this page was. Google's approach was different. It viewed each web page not as being an isolated piece of content, but as part of this network, the World Wide Web. And so fundamentally, it's taking advantage of the network structure of the web in determining importance. So how does it take advantage of this network structure? Well, any page that is more central in the web is considered by Google to be more important. So with Google's approach, if a web page is more central in the web, then it's more important. But how do you define centrality? Well, the definition of centrality here is related to something that might be familiar to you if you think about your social or professional networks. A person of influence is often someone who other people of influence consider influential. Or an important person is someone who other important people think are important. Centrality and important pages thinking that you are important are very closely related and the relationship is made rigorous through the measurement of something called the page rank of a page. Let's understand this connection between centrality and this measure page rank in two different ways. The first way to understand it is by imagining someone surfing the web for an infinite period of time. You start at a randomly chosen web page, you choose a hyperlink from that page at random, you click on it, you arrive at another page. You choose a hyperlink from that second page at random. You click on it, you arrive at a third page. Now, if this random surfer does this for an extremely long period of time, covering different pages around the web multiple times, then what PageRank is measuring is the average fraction of time that this random surfer who is infinitely patient will spend on a particular page. And so the idea of centrality becomes clearer now because loosely speaking, if a page is more central on the web, then chances are that this person who is randomly surfing through the web is gonna pass through that page more frequently. 
Let's move beyond that intuitive definition of page rank and understand more precisely how page rank is computed by going through a really simple example. In the example, imagine that the web consists of four pages, A, B, C, and D. Page A links to pages B, C, and D. Page B has a hyperlink to page A and page C. And page C has a hyperlink to page A. Page D has a hyperlink to page C. If we actually draw the network associated with these hyperlinks, this is what the network of this simplified version of the web looks like. We start the process of computing page rank by saying that, well, we don't know anything about the relative importance of any of these pages yet. So let's assign them all equal importance. And we want the page rank total to sum to one. So we assign each of these four pages a page rank of one quarter or 0.25. After assigning each page an equal value, what we do next is we allocate to every page that a particular page points to a fraction of its page rank. So we take page A's page rank, we look for all the pages that it points to, which are B, C, and D in this case, and we allocate an equal fraction of A's page rank to pages B, C, and D. Similarly, page B points to pages A and C. So we take page B's page rank and we divide it equally among the two pages that it points to, A and C. And we do a similar thing for page C and for page D. Now, after dividing the existing page rank among all of the pages that a particular page points to, what we do next is we add up these numbers. And so we take all of the page rank flowing into page A from the previous round, and we add it up to get A's new page rank value. So A has half of a quarter flowing to it from B and a quarter flowing to it from C. And so A's new page rank is a quarter plus an eighth or three eighths, 0.375. And we do a similar summation for B, C, and D. What I'd like you to do now is to pause the video, to look at the numbers on the slide, and to do this computation yourself, adding up the numbers that are on the arrows flowing into a page and confirming that they add up to the number that's on the page. All right, so you've confirmed that we did our math right on that first round of page rank computation. What happens next? Well, we repeat this process of dividing a page's page rank among the pages that it points to in equal fractions. So we take A's new page rank, which is 0.375, and divide it equally among pages B, C, and D that it points to. We take B's new page rank, which is 0.083, and divide it equally among pages A and C, since it points to page A and page C. And we do the same thing for pages C and D. And if we repeat what we did in the previous round, adding up the page rank that is flowing into each page, we get yet another new set of potential page rank values. So again, I'd like you to pause the video and confirm that the fractions flowing into each page add up to the number associated with each page. So at this point, you're probably looking at the length of this video and wondering how long this process is gonna go on. I'm not going to take you through the entire repeated way in which we arrive at the final values of page rank. This is done by a computer, and computers are really good at doing these kinds of things fast. But a question that might be on your mind is, where does this process end? For networks that have certain properties, which I won't go into right now, I'll discuss them in greater detail in class, you know that you're going to arrive at a set of final values that are final in the following sense. You take the page rank value of each page, you divide it up among the pages that it points to, and you sum up the value flowing into each page, what you end up with is the same set of values that you started with. For our simple example of four web pages, those values, those final values, 
are 2 fifths or 0.4 for page A, 2 fifteenth for page B and D, and 1 third for page C. So I'd like you to pause the video again for the final time and confirm that if we start with these values, 2 fifths for A, 2 fifteenths for B and D, and 1 third for C, you divide up the page rank among the pages that a particular page points to, and then you sum up the page rank flowing into a page, that you will end up with these values again, 2 fifths, 2 fifteenths, 2 fifteenths, and 1 third. These are the values at which we say the page rank algorithm has converged. And I find it really fascinating that these values, which reflect the importance of a page as measured by how important the other important pages think a page is, are identical to the fraction of time that our random surfer would spend if he or she were surfing the web for an infinite period of time. Both of these ideas lead to exactly the same mathematical result. Now, it's important to understand that the way Google ranks search results today, and even the way that it started out ranking search results in the mid-1990s, doesn't follow the process that we have described exactly. Even in the very early days, Google had to immediately introduce some tweaks to their algorithm to account for, for example, pages that don't have hyperlinks to any other page. Over the last 20 years, Google has introduced a wide variety of enhancements and improvements to its search algorithm. Most of these are proprietary, known only to Google's search team. After all, this is something that powers a business that generates billions of dollars of revenue every month. But some of the things that Google uses today include where you're searching from, what your prior search history was, and how you've reacted to prior search results. But the core idea, leveraging the network structure of the web and using something related to centrality as a core element of predicting how important a page is, is still part of the Google algorithm. And not just the Google algorithm, powers every successful search algorithm out there today. It's an interesting full circle for the web, where the web was designed as a network to allow people to surf. People don't surf anymore, but the fact that the web is a network continues to be central to how we find information on the web effectively, because every successful search algorithm is leveraging the network position of a page in determining how important it is. So the concept of hypertext was supposed to reflect how the human brain is wired to consume information. We're not wired to get information in a linear fashion, but when we're reading something, we might get interested in a particular topic and want to learn more about it. So hypertext is mirroring in some ways how our brain wants to consume information. And hypertext allows you to click on that concept and learn more. And so rather than being constrained by the linear flow of information,